So I'm, I'm based in Leiden and my background is in astronomy and science communication. So I did my bachelor's and master's in astronomy, but then got a chance to specialize in science communication, which is everything from journalism to museums and informal science education. And during that time, I got a chance to do an internship with one of the IAU offices in Cape Town. And that's where I learned about this field of astronomy for development. And we've started that in Europe since a while now. And I've been giving this talk at all the Dutch astronomy institutes to create a bit more awareness so that people know about all these different aspects of astronomy, how it sits in society, and uh, just to, to show what's going on and that you can be involved if you want to. All right, so I'm assuming my screen is sharing right now. I'm just gonna keep this open in the corner so that I still see some faces. Might make it a bit uh, easier for me to envision my audience. <laughs> So I currently coordinate the European Regional Office of Astronomy for Development, which is one of the offices of the International Astronomical Union. Um, and this is based in Leiden, but it's together with the European Astronomical Society. And even though it is in Leiden, this is really a European office. And the reason that we are talking about this to all astronomers is that we want this to be something that is part of the entire astronomy community. Everyone who works in astronomy can be part of this and can help shape it. So whenever there's ideas or input feedback, that is, that is what we're looking for. So just for those who have never heard of this, and I'm assuming that's quite a few of you, I mean, I had never heard of it either, the, the IU has all these different aspects to it. Of course, it's the international uh, organization of all professional astronomers. It's, it protects the, the field that we do, the research, but it also looks at all these different things. So there's offices for outreach and education, and then the one that I work for for development, which is to have head office in Cape Town. So this is an initiative that started, I think, about 10, 11 years ago. And first, they, they only had this head office in Cape Town. But they started creating these regional offices because the, the mission is the same everywhere. It's using astronomy, its skills, its people, the, the tools that we create, the infrastructure that we have to benefit societies worldwide in every possible way. But of course, development and contributing to development is very, very different in different parts of the world. It's something that you know, it's, it's extremely complex. So having regional offices is almost a requirement to be able to do this uh, effectively. Now, what you can see in this map is that we we are covering quite a bit of the world right now. There's still some pieces missing, although they're always on the lookout for more offices when necessary. But what is interesting is that both the North American office and the European office are the two most recent ones. So this initiative really started in the developing world where for a lot of people, it made the most sense because there, are, you know, there's a lot of things still to be done. But in the, in the past two years, we also started bringing this to Europe and to North America. And I think that really showcases that there's still a need to contribute to development everywhere. These issues are usually global, but even on smaller scales, there's still a lot that we can improve in these areas. So, all right, I'm going to move you guys around again. <laughs> the, the rationale behind this, this office is that astronomy is an extremely versatile science. I mean, as, as we all know, the science and the research itself brings a lot of knowledge that is you know, very, very interesting. And it's, it's also a gateway to all these different sciences. Astronomy connects to, to chemistry, biology, and that makes it very interesting for education, for example. You can use astronomy as a gateway to catch people's attention, but then also make them interested in different fields that are maybe a bit closer to what they see on Earth. But there's also the technology and skills that we have. And I think all astronomers by now know that there's a lot of spin off technologies that arose in, in astronomy research, but then also found their ways into applications in society. But there's actually a lot of that. There's a lot of things, whenever you push boundaries of what you can measure, what you can see, that will one way or another always have its impact on society. And that is something that on one hand just sort of happens, but that you can also strive for a bit more, more actively. And then there's this orange part, and that is the more intangible societal impact that astronomy has, but that may be even more important than the others. And that is the fact that it's, it is, it's inspiring to people. You know, people have always looked up at the sky and, and wondered where we come from and, and where everything fits in in the universe. And this is something that makes astronomy extremely powerful. Once you've catch people's attention, once they listen, you can go into a lot of different topics and, and show that astronomy can indeed be very relevant for for societies down here on Earth. So the framework that we use are the, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, because as I said, development is extremely complex. There's a lot of different aspects to it. And having a framework to see where you can contribute just helps things a lot. 
So for people working in development, these things are obvious. You see them everywhere, but I'm assuming not everyone might be familiar. So there are 17 goals that were established that should hopefully be achieved by 2030, although I think it's a, it's a beautiful thing to try and, and get that done by 2030, but these things might take longer. And even though it seems that astronomy might not have links to a lot of these different goals, I mean, what can we do about poverty, hunger, and all those? There's actually more connections than you might think at first instance. So to show that a little bit, I wanna go into a little bit more examples to sort of show what astronomy for development can mean, because I think it can still be difficult to grasp the concept if you've never heard of it. So the OAD has funded different projects. That is the, the main function of this headquarter office in South Africa. And these are just numbers. As you can see, that's not a lot of money because this is over the time span of six years. Um, but they have been able to fund a lot of projects through this. And even though small scale, they had a real tangible impact on communities. So this is just a map that shows where these funded projects are happening. And Again, this is to show that development is happening everywhere. This is not just something that is relevant for, for poor countries or countries with a low socioeconomic index. This is something that we can do everywhere. For example, through these projects. So I have chosen these three, just, they're just a highlight. There's a lot more going on, but I think to show the, the breadth of things that astronomy for development can mean. So the one on the left, Columba Hepathia, is, is a personal favorite of mine. It's a, it's a project that is happening on the island of Cyprus. And some people may know on Cyprus, you've got two communities, the Turks and the Greeks, and they quite literally live on the two different ends of the island. There is no contact between the two communities. It's a very hostile environment. And since many years, there have been a lot of different peace building activities going on at the, the border of those two communities. There's this safe zone in the middle. And astronomy, some astronomers there decided that with astronomy, outreach and education, they might be able to contribute to that. So this goes back to the fact that astronomy is inspiring and it's, it is harmless in a sense. You know, kids might not wanting to go to a peace building activity, but they might want to go to an astronomy lesson. So in the middle, in the, in the buffer zone between these two communities, they started this project just exciting children about the cosmos and about physics. And in this way, they brought those children from the two communities closer together. And through those children, they reached some of the parents and the teachers. And throughout time, they actually made quite a significant impact here. Uh, the kids got to know each other and got to see that they are not all that different. And I think that shows a very impactful side of astronomy. It shows you that we are all under the same sky. And if you do it right, you can use that to start discussions about that, that helped peace building everywhere. So that was quite interesting to see that amidst all these other peace building initiatives, astronomy actually had a very special role and may have been more efficient than some of the other initiatives, especially for young children. The one in the middle is more related to economic impact. And this, is, this was happening in the Himalaya and they are now trying to uh, increase the reach and bringing this initiative to different countries throughout the world. And this is about astrotourism. So this project targets villages in remote areas that usually have not even internet and electricity connection. So they bring electricity there through solar panels and they teach local women to run homestays and give astronomy tours. So in this way, they can bring sustainable tourism to those areas in a sustainable way and bringing income to the region. So in the, the smallest places that have very, very little, they provided training. They empowered the people to run homestays, to understand how to rig electricity. So they combined a lot of different topics, brought income through tourism through these regions, and in this way really helps in areas that would have had no other way of bringing tourism there. Now the one on the right is one that for most astronomers is completely obvious. Every astronomer know that we are a super data intensive science. Every astronomer is a programmer. And that is a skill that nowadays is, is usable in every different sector. If you graduate as an astronomer and you decide not to go into research, you get job offers in so many different fields. And these skills are super important. And that is something that we can transfer to young people everywhere. So this specific project was interesting because these big data skills 
um, did not only address technical and scientific issues, they used local societal challenges uh, for which they had enough data to apply the skills to these issues um, and, and show how, really how these skills are relevant outside of astronomy. So these are just some, some highlights, but there's a lot more. There's these initiatives going on for gender equality, for um, equal access to education, for example, for the visually impaired. So there's a lot of things going on across the world. But I am here for the, the European Regional Office, which was the, the first office outside of the developing world. And we signed a contract in 2018, but really only started last year, simply because we first had to get money to get started. But I think this was really interesting to see that for the first time there was enough support to start something like this in the Netherlands, in Europe. Um, and it was endorsed by this minister for, uh, I think back then she was the Minister of Foreign Affairs, or no, she was then Science and Technology, now she's Foreign Affairs Minister in South Africa. And she really sees as well how astronomy is benefiting South Africa as a country on a global stage and really supporting these, these offices very well. So of course, we started out by setting our strategic objectives. As you can see, there's a ton of different things that you can do and I would love to do them all, but that's not, that's not possible, unfortunately, not as long as we don't have an army of people. So the, the first target is, is really a very practical one. We need to mobilize resources. Now, of course, that means money, but more importantly, that means people. Without people, you can't get a lot of things done. And also, you can't understand all of the European context. I might understand a little bit about the Netherlands, and even I don't want to say that I understand development in my own country very well. But we need people everywhere to understand how things differ from country to country. The second objective that we have was decided based on the entire network of all these sister offices throughout the world. So we reached out to them asking how they thought the European office could really help this network. Having this office in a region where there's a lot of knowledge and experience, how can that help them? And they simply said that they can, we can help them build human capacity. We can help share what we know and have and that way help them build. And we can also learn from their experience in astronomy for development. So linking up this entire network to be more solid and more collaborative. And the third one is this idea of using astronomy to foster global citizenship. Now, global citizenship is a term that simply means seeing yourself as a citizen of all of Earth and not just of one city. And this is a mindset that can help you address global challenges a lot more. So for example, if you look at climate change, this is something that if you live in a place where you don't see climate change, you might not feel the urge to address it, to, to get into action. But if you can understand that Earth is interconnected, that what happens someplace else is re relevant to you as well, can really help you address these, these global challenges. And this is also something that can help for peace building. So I'll go a bit more into detail for all these different objectives that we have. Now for the first one, at the moment, because we, we've been only running for less than a year now, we are still building this European network. So we are appointing national representatives to really understand how each European country can benefit from this office, what is already happening, because we don't want to duplicate anything that's already happening, but we do want to connect different initiatives so we can all learn from each other. And this also means liaising with, with partners in fields that are relevant to development. I mean, this office is mostly built by astronomers. But astronomers don't know everything. We know a lot, but we don't know everything about development. And we, we are going to need input from people who do, do have that expertise. And then, of course, there's some fundraising initiatives that they'll pass by when I go through the different projects that we are currently running. So this is something that we started, but unfortunately for now has been put on hold for a little bit, simply because we don't have the manpower to continue. But we wanted to create this knowledge base of we see these links between astronomy and the sustainable development goals, the SDGs. But we want to be able to say, this is where we contribute specifically. These goals are split up into a lot of different targets and indicators that are a lot more measurable. And being able to say that astronomy contributes to specific indicators is very powerful because it shows the potential that we have as a field to really contribute to society. Um, and of course, it can also be an inspiration for people to see that if you want to do outreach and education, if you want to connect with the general public or maybe with industry or local governments, that there's different ways of doing it. 
Um, and of course, it can also show you where you may be contributing more, but you are not doing at the moment. So this can lead to recommendation, recommended actions and recommendations for the future. So we started with this sort of trying to dig into the global astronomy community. There's some social science and qualitative research methods for that that are extremely interesting, but that I won't go into detail now. So I hope that we can be continuing this in the future again. Now, what we are doing is partnering up with this group that's called Astronomers for Planet Earth. And this is an initiative that started in the US. And about a year ago, I think at the EWAS conference in Lyon, there was a group of astronomers that started talking about sustainability. I mean, there was a heat wave going on back then, and there wasn't enough water, there wasn't enough cooling. Maybe some of you remember the situation. So it sparked a lot of conversations about climate. And this, this group grew and connected to the, the American counterpart. And of course, climate is a huge topic within development and something that is just very important for all of us to be part of. And there's these two things that astronomy can mean in the climate challenge discussion. On the one hand, we can do a lot of outreach and education. And that is because astronomy has a very unique perspective on Earth and on its climate. We can see it from the outside. We can see how it fits within the entire Milky Way and, and universe. And that is a powerful perspective. It's, it shows us that it's, you know, it's our only home planet. We don't have a different place to go. And that is, that is very powerful. So within outreach education, I think it's quite clear that we can do something there. But of course, also within our own communities, there is a lot to be gained. Um, sustainability is not always at the top priority of research institutes, although a lot more carbon audits are happening nowadays. So providing astronomers with the knowledge and some tools to change the way that they're doing conferences and all of that can really help make an impact. Astronomers travel a lot. We have a lot of computing power and thinking about how we can make it sustainable will make the field more future proof. So there's a lot going on here and the EAS is working on it. They have created a working group on sustainability. So this is very interesting progress. Now, this is the first of the two bigger projects that we have set up with the, the E-Road office. The first is about this capacity building, the first strategic objective that we had. And we are setting up this training program um, to share expertise and resources. So for this, we've been mapping the needs of the other regional offices of astronomy for development, the roads. Um, the idea here is that there's a lot of people that may be lacking certain knowledge or skills that they need in their institutes. And there's a lot of astronomers in different institutes that have that knowledge. And simply finding the matches between these two can help a lot. I know that there's a lot of astronomers that would like to help, you know, and sometimes you're lucky enough to find someone in a different institute where you can make that connection, and sometimes you aren't. So we're trying to set up a platform where we can sort of fill in this gap, find out what people need, what people can offer, and make these uh, these matches and we we already said way in the beginning that a lot of this can be done online whether it is supervising students mentoring or giving courses now the world is showing that we indeed can do a lot of these things online so the first step that we've made in this is writing proposals for the erasmus plus international credit mobility call this is european funding that enables researchers to travel through different institutes so for this call, we were only able to write proposals for four different countries, Nigeria, Ethiopia, Armenia, and Colombia. And this is where four of the other regional offices are based. And the idea here is that, of course, you can teach people a lot about astronomy, but we found that our partners in these countries already have access, in, in many cases at least, to the sort of the technical content and the technical knowledge. But what they are lacking and what they are seeing that their students are lacking are these sort of more soft skills that you need to be able to work in an international market. So this means, for example, project management, proposal writing, academic English, but also just being able to present your projects well to local governments. And these are skills that within Northwestern Europe, at least, we, we learn easily. It just happens in the course of your training, but we might not always realize that this is what some fields are missing. If you are not able to write your proposal in good English, that is not going to help you because people will judge you for it, even though the content of the idea might have been great. So these proposals work if they go through, of course, we will be teaching uh, there for a week to train young scientists and some of the teachers there in these skills so that they can transfer this to next generations of students there. On the other hand, it also gives uh, young students and researchers an opportunity to come to Leiden 
uh, and to be able to train here for a bit and see how a different research institute is working. And this international experience when you're a young researcher is extremely important and it's not always an option if you come from poorer countries. So of course, this is just a partnership between individual countries and only Leiden even in the Netherlands. And we want to see this grow into a bigger partnership from different institutes, different countries, where people can travel through all these different places. And this is possible within Erasmus Plus if this first sort of round of exchanges is a success. We hope that we can be going into this next phase with a larger partnership. Now, the, the second thing that I want to go into is this priority of sort of fostering inclusive societies and global citizenship. So the project that we are starting here is Pill Blue Dots, of course, named after the famous photo of Earth. Uh, and this is also just expertise that we have in Leiden. Um, in Leiden University, there's a team that has been working on outreach and education through, for example, universal awareness for a long time. Uh, and they want to build this into something maybe a bit more sustainable. Now, there's, of course, a lot of different focus areas that we would love to be doing. Um, and hopefully we'll get the chance. We are writing proposals to try and see if we can get into this. But there's a lot of different things that astronomy can do and that hopefully with time and with building this network throughout Europe, we can be doing. But for now, it's about the pill blue dot. The other reason that we chose this topic is that the OAD headquarters in South Africa has made this one of their flagship projects. Um, I think they call it Astronomy for Humanity. And of course, this is all, all based on, on this quote of Carl Sagan, right? I think a lot of astronomers are aware of Carl Sagan and he just says things very eloquently. So here you can read the full thing. Look again at that dot, that's here, that's home. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. And that is very powerful. That is something um, that's, that not a lot of fields can offer, right? As you can see in these different photos from the earth rise in the left to the pale blue dot photo of Carl Sagan to the, the, the cassini huygens mission showing the day the earth smiled. You see Earth as an incredibly small blue dot um, and seeing that that is our home that we all share together and that we all have to take care of together. So specifically in Europe, we are starting this project Pill Blue Dots and its first objective is really to promote global citizenship and tolerance. It's about global solidarity so that you feel connected to people everywhere and be kinder to people everywhere. And the second goal is about climate change using this awareness about the interconnectedness of our planet to see that our planet is quite fragile and we do need to protect its environment for the sake of our own existence on this planet. And then only on the third place, we also have this objective of enthusing children about science and technology in general. And usually in a lot of education and outreach initiatives, this is the, the number one goal. But for us, that is almost not important. Of course, it happens and it's great if it happens, but if we really want to exploit these other two primary objectives to show that astronomy can really contribute to these parts in development. So the plan is that we will do this as a research practice project. Normally in outreach and education, you just develop some materials or content and you start doing it and you might see how people react, but people don't always research the effectiveness in the way that we evaluate a lot of different things that we do. We evaluate teaching, we, definitely evaluate the research, but not always outreach and education. And we think that it's extremely important to do that. And because we have this huge network across the world, we have a chance of doing it this time because it is not easy, but it is something that will make us able to improve and to see what works and what doesn't. And of course, things need to be tailored to cultures across the world. But for that, we have a lot of people on the ground in different cultures that can help adapt it. So we plan to design this for young children, so because we think that is when we can have the biggest impact. When children are young, that is when their value systems are changing, when they are developing a sense of, you know, who, who am I, who are my friends, how do I fit into this world, and how they see everything. So this is when we think we can have a large impact on how they see other people. And this will contribute to these three SDGs. We always try to connect back to the sustainable development goals, um, and more specifically to these indicators. So for the research aspects, like I said, it's not gonna be easy, especially because it needs to be very multidisciplinary. Of course, you need to have people from educationalists, but also from cultural psychology and, and name it, all these different things. 
but this will create an evidence base and this will show that astronomy has a lot of potential for this. Now, I think I'm, uh, I'm gonna round up here because I don't think these talks are supposed to be very long. So, like I said at the beginning, this is really for you to just know what is going on here and that this exists in the first place, but also if you want to be involved, that that is possible. So, like I said, we will continue the twinning program next year uh, in a bigger sort of partnership with more institutes. And if you think that you could be part of that or want to be part of that, that is great. And the same goes for the pill blue dot. And on the other hand, if you just like to think about this a bit more, but are interested in the topics, we have two more uh, occasions at least coming up where we will be discussing all these topics of development and the future of astronomy, both in the EAS annual meeting in 2020, uh, previously called EWAS, we will have two sessions, but we will also have a workshop by the end of November this year about how space sciences and astronomy can contribute to societal challenges. So basically we're just looking for any kind of input and ideas. So yeah, thanks all for listening. I hope you find it interesting. Um, and I look forward to having some questions or discussions about these topics. Thank you. <laughs> all right, okay. I leave my slides open for a bit in case people have uh, questions about something specific. Yeah, that, <laughs> thank you so much for that. Let's uh, open the floor to questions. Just put up your little um, virtual hand. I can't put up a virtual hand, but I can uh, start speaking. Hey, um, uh, so you, you, the, that, was a, that was an interesting talk with very aspirational ideas, and um, which is pretty cool to see. Uh, you, you briefly touched on it um, about sort of determining the sort of metrics that you can use to evaluate that. Um, it seems like a very, very complex thing to do. Yeah? Are you confident in the ability to be able to even provide a metric? Not, not really uh, one kind of metric. I don't think that's possible. For one project, maybe you, of course, will be able to develop a, a framework to assess and evaluate it properly. But for all of the societal impacts that are out there, it is very difficult to establish one metric. So, of course, there are some initiatives out there that I've investigated just a, a while ago in, in some, uh, some short studies. There are initiatives out there that are trying to create metrics to uh, assess societal impact. They also realize that you can't have the same metric for different fields even and that it is all very complicated. Um, but what we are trying to do within like this study of connecting it to the SDGs is more practical. So okay I guess I will go into a little bit into the details of how the qualitative research methods work. What the idea is is that even if you don't have metrics you are able to map all the different links and potential links that can be made in the future by going into sort of the minds of the entire global astronomy community. And how you can do that is through a, a Delphi method where you ask certain questions and you try to ask a lot of people, how do you think we can ex name different examples or things that can be done on an institute level? And then you ask all those people, do they know other people that might know more? And this way you can go reach more and more people beyond your own network and ask them all the same questions and you can give them each other's answers and at some point they will converge. So they will, with the entire community, converge to one sort of answer where you don't get any more new information. Um, so in this way with sort of snowball sampling on the one hand where you reach out into communities across the world and a Delphi method where you have rounds of questions where at some point the information and answers will converge, you can say that you have found a representation of everything that a global community knows. And of course that is not a metric per se, but it is at least showcasing all the different things that are out there, which is already quite solid because you can say that it is based on not just one group of people, but really on a community. Um, and of course, that is always gonna be less of a rigid result than in uh, quantitative research, but within the qualitative research possibilities, that is the best that you can get pretty much. Yeah, okay, cool. Now <laughs> that gives a, a bit of a background. It will be also then interesting, just based on your answer, um, to see if all of these offices finally get merged together to a g general sort of outreach. Because I think, for me, uh, hearing the presentation, um, there are many abbreviations, many different groups all working alongside each other, but why there wasn't just a, a generic um, flag or title or whatever. Yes, that, that escaped me slightly. But uh, thanks for the talk.
Great, thanks. <laughs> okay, we have Jason. Jason. A question from Jason. Uh, thank you very much for your nice talk. Um, so I have a somewhat provocative question. I, I guess outside of the field of astronomy, people who work on, on SDGs in a very concrete, practical way, you know, clean water, zero hunger, do you ever get reactions from, from these groups about the way in which uh, astronomy approaches the SDGs? I mean, you emphasize, you know, the, the perspective that astronomy brings to global citizenship, but do you ever get some um, negative feedback from, from people who are very practically trying to solve problems right now? Yeah. Yes, yes, of course. Um, when someone can say that they can solve hunger, then inspiration is not, you know, the best competition. I, and we see those reactions. But I think at the same time, people realize that you need to do all of those different things. And I think that the easiest way out for astronomy is to just fall back onto the economic impact that we have. You know, we do solve a lot of practical things with space data that we have, with the software that we develop. Um, so there are a lot of technical spin-offs that you can sort of throw out to those people that have negative comments to show that there is a lot of things happening. I think there's, I don't remember the exact reference, but there's actually indications that um, basic research, so just research for the sake of curiosity, ends up in a lot more applications than applied research. And that shows that really investing into these fundamental sciences gives a lot of benefits to societies in the end in a very, very down to earth practical level. But I think even when you know you don't do that, when you try to defend the, the perspective and inspiration, I think people see that. I mean, people see that education is extremely important. Even though it might not do something now, you realize that you're investing into the next generation. You're investing into the mindset of a generation of people. And that is what outreach does as well. It is trying to change behaviors. And even though that is less tangible, I think in the end, people do see the merit of that. Of course, yeah, discussing see, into what is more important, you know, <laughs> yeah, there's no yeah, answer. Yeah. But. Yeah, you guys see it as part of a portfolio, short-term, long-term, concrete, abstract. Yeah. Exactly. I think, you know, of course, as an office, we can only do so much. But I think as the entire field of astronomy for development, there are indeed all these different kinds of impact that you can have. And all together, they really show how astronomy benefits society. Any more questions? Do, do you expect the Lorentz workshop to fill up? Is it open registration? I actually don't know how. Uh, well, no, that is all a little bit of a mess at the moment because the Lawrence Center is also figuring out how to deal with this pandemic going on. So even though it is only in November, we are most likely going to be doing this online simply because this is part of a project that will also end by December this year. So we need to make sure that it can be happening. Mm. And if it's in person and then at the last minute, you know, we realize that it can't happen. That is just not an option. So we might be doing it online, but that is very outside of the comfort zone of the Lawrence Center. So we are still discussing with them how we're going to do this. So I think it will be up online somewhere in the next month. Okay, maybe we'll give another moment for, for final questions. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen in the meantime. Well, I yeah. can then continue on if no one else has a question. <laughs> was, was Ralph starting to speak? Go ahead, go, Ralph. Go ahead, I'll take the next one. Um, all right, then, uh, then uh, just circling back to why there are so many different agencies for what seems to be a general same purpose um, with astronomy trying to reach society. Um, is, is there any efforts towards merging these all into a large group or is, was the whole idea of having these separate little groups that you're trying to really reach different audiences and yet not inventing the same wheel twice? Um, do you have any yeah, thoughts, comments? Yeah, of course. So indeed, there is a lot of different organizational structures here, which can be more of a hassle than anything else, right? And the IAU has decided to really make these different offices for outreach, development, and education. But of course, there's a lot of overlap already on this level. And the idea is that we all focus on our different parts, but we collaborate a lot. So all these IAU initiatives are in regular contact. We speak with each other every three months to show how we can collaborate. So sometimes it might have the branding of one, but it is actually done combined with the others. And then the, the OAD, the Office of Astronomy for Development, is also more divided into all these regional offices. And that started because we felt it was absolutely necessary. You know, 
when you have an office in one place, it is very difficult to understand the situation in a different place, even with the European office. You know, our, our office is based in the Netherlands. So it's very difficult for us to understand how we can contribute and how we can be valuable in, per se, Eastern Europe, because that is such a different context. So you do yep. need... No, no, that, that region part, indeed, uh, that was something. Uh, it was more, indeed, just the, the development versus education versus... Oh, ah, okay, no, because uh, even with these regions, it can be quite a struggle, right? Because people start doing their own thing. And if you don't communicate well and collaborate, you can also diverge into different directions and not be learning with each other anymore. So even there on the regions, we already have this struggle to some extent, um, but we are now collaborating more than we were before. But yeah, also with these offices for outreach, education, development, it is really the IAU that decided that we need these three different ones. But like I said, it almost feels like we are sort of one office with different branches because we work together quite a lot. Okay, cool. Yep. Thanks for the context. Yeah, I, uh, uh, may, maybe I missed this, but is, is there, uh, you mentioned quite a few things that some of us might be interested in joining or participating in. Um, could you leave us with a pointer where we can reread all this information so that we can, we, we can find the right place to? Of course. Um, so first of all, I can share my slides uh, with Gaman and Liam and they can well, I've passed them on to you and they will also put this, I think, the recording of this entire talk online. Besides that, we are working on our own website for the European office that will be online, I think, in two weeks. So by then, I can really point you to a great location where all of this will be in detail. So unfortunately, that's not online yet. The main office in Cape Town has their own website, but they don't go into detail of what all the regional offices are doing. So that might not give you all the information you want. However, they do have a volunteer portal. Uh, so I can send the link to that as well, together with the, the slides, where people who want to be involved but don't know where to start or what they can do, there's this portal that is also super new, but we are uploading sort of all these tasks around the world from very small things to can people help translating to maybe some larger projects. So mm -hmm. we are sort of working on making it easier to be part of this. <laughs> good. Yeah, it would be good to... Uh, I'm sure the the... The, the link to the to your website will be mailed around the Dutch community as soon as you have exactly, it. Exactly, exactly. By then, you know, we have these, the Dutch institutes are very well connected through NOVA. So yeah, the news yeah. about that will be distributed. Okay, great. Anything else? More questions? All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Michelle. That was great.